10 minutes. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, slightly different talk to the uh, main symposium, but uh, hopefully you'll find a f uh, s some interest. So, um, it, I'm, I'm talking about uh, um, dry eye, not in OSDI patients as such, but um, in a normal patient. So, um, but you know, we're, uh, um, we're cataract surgeons. Um, and uh, most of my colleagues, when I talk to them, um, they say, uh, I'm a cataract surgeon and I don't see any dry eye patients. Um, just, uh, just at the bottom, there's my contact details. Uh, this is a separate issue uh, completely, but I run a, um, a charity in Cambodia. And uh, we've already had uh, quite a few volunteers from India, but uh, if anyone's interested in uh, joining us, uh, that's uh, our theater in, in Cambodia, um, please uh, contact me. So the other end of the spectrum is uh, somebody like myself who um, actually does um, probably 95% premium IOLs. Um, and I worry about uh, dry eye all the time. Um, you know, it's a... Uh, uh, it's the major cause of headache um, with your patient following surgery. It's not, uh, th uh, the surgery technically can be fine uh, and the patient hates you. So um, you all know um, the, they've changed the definitions of dry eye a little bit. So with TFOS DUS2, it's a multifactorial disease, uh, essentially loss of homeostasis. Um, and these are the criteria that you have to have. Ocular symptoms, instability, hyperosmolarity, so that's a new thing. And also inflammation has come into the definition now. And it's a big problem. Uh, so if you, if you look around the world, um, you know, in some countries 50% um, of people have dry eyes by standard definitions. And uh, why is it different in different countries? Uh, you know, it might be the anatomy of the eyelids, um, uh, the temperature, th there's all sorts of different factors. And um, this, is the, uh, this is what they s uh, feel is the uh, problem. So you, ha you have um, an ocular surface problem and you have a tear film problem. So you... Um, you almost need to think about this nowadays as engineering. Um, you know, you have a, um, you have a windscreen, um, you have your uh, rain or your um, uh, sort of the, uh, the covering, but in addition you have your, your wipers. Your eyelid is your wiper and um, the engineering part of that and how it um, spreads the, um, the tears around is very important. And of course, we when you're talking about dry eye, what, what are the um, uh, dry eye causes that we actually cause? I mean, it's obvious, isn't it? It's, uh, firstly, surgery, and then it's the drops we give. So we're one of the main problems of the dry eye. And once you, um, you know, uh, it's almost a, a light bulb moment. Uh, once you realize this, then you, um, you need to start looking at how you, um, how you manage this. And, but we, we st um, in the standard hospitals, the non-refractive surgeons, um, the, the, the main comment I get is, my patients don't get dry eye. But unfortunately, this is, uh, you know, this is, we all know this is completely false. Um, uh, the reality is probably 100% of your patients get post-cataract surgery dry eye. Um, we just tend to ignore it because we did, we're, we're interested in the surgery. But actually, it's, um, it's a problem. So then if you are a premium lens user, you have to start uh, sort of, um, uh, saying, is, uh, is there a reason that um, your premium lens patients um, uh, get unhappy? It's the dry eye. You know, that, um, I mean, th there are many types of premium IOLs. Uh, some patients like some uh, uh, and don't like others, but um, to get the best out of your premium IOL, you have to have a good ocular surface. So what should you be doing? Um, I mean, my, my practice actually is on um, all dry eye, um, so all patients coming in for cataract surgery get assessed for dry eye. Um, it's just part of, uh, as well as having biometry, 
and a discussion on the type of IOLs, they have a dry eye assessment. So this can be quite extensive. So you have a, um, uh, a dry eye questionnaire like OSDI. Um, you have a non-invasive tear breakup time. Um, you look for ocular surface staining both with fluorescein and with lysamine green and back to the, um, the eyelids as your lid wipers. So this is a sort of uh, lid wiper epitheliopathy. So if, you, if you've got something like this, that means there's a problem. But, you know, on a daily basis, we don't look out for this. And then um, osmolarity. So those of you who are familiar with the tear lab, uh, I mean, it, it does give some variable results, but um, if you've got a, um, a high osmolarity and you ignore it, um, you, you know, you have to be cautious. So we're trying to make your ocular surface happy preoperatively. Um, the, the, if you start doing this postoperatively, you're, um, you're fighting a losing battle. So uh, there's no difference from normal dry eye management. You advise risk factors. You've got to manage the um, blepharitis and uh, MGD and lubricators as necessary. So, I mean, first step, education advice, most important. Um, sometimes we even s send them away for a month or two um, uh, sort of, uh, to take some omega-3 oils. Uh, you need to look at uh, change, you're modifying their medication, even if it's only for the time of the surgery. Um, obviously, opio, uh, ocular lubricants. Um, lid hygiene and wa warm compresses, but done properly. And this is always the problem. Uh, you know, uh, sort of, uh, well, certainly in uh, Britain, traditionally, the, um, uh, the, uh, the lid hygiene uh, is said to, uh, you should use baby shampoo. Um, and you're supposed to use a hot flannel for your compresses. Neither of those work. There, there's lots of evidence saying neither of those work. They're actually proper things to use, so um, uh, why ignore them? Um, I mean, one of the most common things when you start delving into this is the patients don't use their drops. Um, so um, you need to kick them a little bit and just say, uh, if you want good surgery, you need to actually um, make sure your eyes lubricated beforehand. So um, uh, uh, um, you need to use uh, something like the um, a heated wheat bag um, and actually do manual expression of the uh, meibomium glands. Uh, you can do um, uh, lippy flow, but it's extremely expensive. And uh, 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 in my view, there's a limited uh, cost benefit. Um, there's no reason not to do punctal occlusion at this stage um, as a, a temporary. I mean, there, the other thing which I don't think we do well is treat the blepharitis, particularly if there's demodex there. So um, uh, tea tree oil, uh, there aren't, um, the normal things that we use don't touch demodex. So um, yeah, the simple things are tea tree oil, clearidex, or um, zocula, which is a, a relatively new um, uh, product, which is an aubergine ac extract, but seems to work extremely uh, well. Um, uh, here, I think you'll be able to get ivermectin ointment, um, which uh, also works very well. And then um, premium IOLs, I often do th a course of three of uh, um, IPL before surgery. Um, so all for the same reason, I even if the patient doesn't think they've got a problem, um, you're trying to get um, your parameters into a workable um, area. Uh, I don't know, if some of you may have heard about uh, the dev uh, device we've been also trying, which is called Tixel, which is actually a device for um, ring um, wrinkles on the skin, but we're getting as good um, results with that as with IPL, but uh, the difference is um, you can use it on any skin without, uh, without worrying. And don't forget, you should um, use your steroids, use your um, antibiotics. Um, and if you need uh, your anti, uh, sort of uh, treat rosacea as well. I mean, the, the more you look for rosacea, the more it's there. So um, do, do treat it. So what, what happens, uh, you want to do a premium IOL and your um, tear lab um, osmolarity and your non-invasive uh, non tear breakup time don't improve. Um, so in, in my books, uh, you just do not do a multifocal lens. 
I mean, you, um, if you do a multifocal lens, you're asking for trouble because if you can't get the if you can't get the ocular surface um, sorted before they've actually um, had surgery, you'll find it very difficult to sort after they've had surgery. And of course, if you still proceed with uh, the multifocal lens in these patients, you'll have a waiting room looking like this, and um, uh, and you won't have any space to see your new patients. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you must have come across this. You, you have the same patients who keep coming back over and over again just because you need to sort out their dry eye, um, and you can't get any further with them. And, and then you're thinking, well, why did I use this lens? If I just put in a standard lens, uh, I'd have had an easier life. So there are, there are some patients, it doesn't matter how much they want it, you just, um, you just say no. So uh, just uh, some thoughts on the subject. I mean, you, you, um, so uh, the more I've looked into it, the more I've started treating dry eye quite aggressively. So probably in a third of my um, cataract patients, I'll actually have, uh, have some form of intervention um, uh, and uh, uh, probably a quarter have IPL. So I'm quite uh, aggressive um, preoperatively, but then I, um, then I get away with using uh, multifocal lenses in about 95% of my patients. And uh, uh, as I said, the, uh, our charity is the, the one at the uh, bottom. Um, and uh, if anyone's uh, interested, please contact me. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Sunil Shah, sir, uh, for a wonderful talk. Because in spite of a good cataract surgery, we don't know why patient is complaining. We always see vision is 6, 6, and find patient is com always complaining. So we always ignore the dry eye in cataract patients. Uh, sir is leaving. That's why we want to take his questions now. Only two minutes we'll give for question and answer. If you have got any questions, please ask him. I want to ask you first question, sir. Have you any experience with the uh, use of chloroquine phosphate eye drops? No, it's not there. Okay. Not Any other question? I, I always jump straight into sodium hyaluronate. I don't, uh, I, the problem is, uh, you know, these patients have already come to see you for cataract surgery. Um, they want their surgery. So uh, unless there's a question of cost, I just go on to something which I'm confident is likely to work, uh, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the other products may not work in some patients. I, what I tend to do is, um, uh, if I see them, and I can, I do one treatment on the day I see them, another one two weeks later, and a third one on the day of surgery, if you can organize it. So, so they end up waiting a month. Uh, but, but they've already had thr uh, three um, uh, three treatments, and then you can add in a fourth after surgery if needs be. Any other question? In India, it is uh, UV lube by FDC. UV, that is U for ultraviolet. UV lube, it is by FDC. It is the only one company which is producing this thing. I don't have any financial interest. Any other question? Okay, thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Now, since we have a considerable audience, now I invite all the speakers to come on the dais because initially for first five minutes they acted as audience. Now let them <laughs> occupy the chairs on the dais. Friends, this is a advanced SICS instruction course and update. Unfortunately, our own session, Magic of SICS 2 also is concurrently going on in Hall A. We'll be shifting there and I request all of you to shift to Hall A after this course because SICS is always supposed to be little inferior to phacoemulsification because phacoemulsification is a sophisticated procedure and SICS, the bad name for SICS is sometimes we damage cornea in nucleus management, sometimes we induce a high astigmatism. This is about the SICS. But we'll show you some of the advanced SICS technique which can give results which is not possible with phaco or which is not possible even with flax. So for that we have we have this course and in Magic of SICS 2, which is which will be up to 130, they will be seeing these advanced talks again once again without the machine. How you can manage patients' astigmatism? How you can give good result? And there are some talks where with a software guided surgery, a monofocal lens will give a multifocality without inducing glares and halos. And that also you'll see.